Mount Unzen has become most famous for its eruption in 1991, when on the 3rd of June it unleashed a pyroclastic flow that would claim 43 lives. Footage of the eruption has reached near iconic status via the internet. Back in the day when I became interested in volcanoes, it was the first video footage I'd ever seen of a pyroclastic flow, and it easily ranks alongside that iconic image taken during the eruption of Mount Pinatubo as being the poster child for their terrifying dark beauty. As a small child, I was absolutely stunned and petrified by the Pinatubo photo and wanted to do more research on pyroclastic flows. Hence, I came across the Unzen footage and never really looked back. The irony of course being that these two historical time capsules not only show very similar scenes, those damn clowns always seem to be chasing trucks now, don't they? But they were miraculously produced mere weeks from each other. The Pinatubo photo was taken on the 15th of June 1991, while the Unzen photo was captured about a week or so earlier on the 3rd of June. Ironically, both volcanoes share the same plate subduction zone, being both a part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Clearly in 1991 there was just something in the air that made these two sleeping mountains just want to let off some serious steam. While back then the Pinatubo eruption stole much of the world's attention, being the largest of its time and affecting the entire globe to some degree, that massive pyroclastic flow didn't cause any casualties. Most casualties were caused by the ash fall which collapsed roofs. The Unzen flow, however, was a killer one. To this day, it goes down in history as the final eruption that legendary volcanologists Katia and Maurice Kraft and Harry Glicken would ever see. It's also remembered in Japan as a collective failure of the mass media. Many of the casualties ended up being part of the press, and many innocent lives were lost because the media had lured them recklessly close to harm. To this day, the disaster is still remembered with sadness and anger in Japan. If one translates the comments in many videos online, one can still see a lot of raw anger is felt even 30 years later. Clearly, no matter where in the world you are, this eruption will never be forgotten, be it in Japan, in the world of volcanologists, or on the internet. As far as the footage itself goes, it really is quite something. It shows just how terrifying pyroclastic flows can be, how fast they can travel such great distances in such a short space of time. It also shows just how unpredictable and treacherous they can be, emerging from the mist with little to no warning, and then apparently stopping for no reason before suddenly changing direction as though it's being sucked away like a tornado. It's both terrifying but also oddly beautiful because it demonstrates the fine line between life and death. On one hand, we know that 43 people were killed in this eruption, but at the same time we see just how lucky these firefighters and the cameraman were to survive. And even under the dark beauty of this apocalyptic cloud, there remains a village that's spared, lush and green with tobacco fields and rice terraces, planted atop centuries of Unzen's fertile, mineral-rich volcanic deposits. Sadly, this town wouldn't survive further eruptions and is nothing but buried, barren wasteland to this day. When you keep all this in mind, it's no wonder that a video like this is often included in most documentaries about volcanoes, the crafts, Unzen, and is often used in many of those top 10 volcanic eruption videos online. But having personally been researching the Unzen disaster for quite a few years now, there are a few misconceptions about that famous video that I'd like to clear up. Let's start with that iconic sequence that was first used in the 1997 documentary Nature's Inferno, and for some reason filmmakers continue to insist on using in their documentaries, even to this day. Only one of the four shots used in this sequence is actually from that 3rd of June eruption, and that is, naturally, the final one. The first two shots of the dome collapsing couldn't be of the fatal eruption, because on June 3rd, 1991, the mountain's summit was entirely obscured by both rain clouds and dispersing ash from prior eruptions, meaning that neither helicopters nor distant tripods were able to film the summit on that day. As one can see, this collapse shown isn't especially large. Only the very forefront of the dome gives way. The fatal pyroclastic flow was caused by a major collapse of 1.5 million cubic meters of material that actually took away part of the underlying summit, leaving not only very little lava dome left, but also a significant collapse scar. If I was to guess, I'd say these two shots weren't actually filmed on the 3rd of June at all, and were either recorded prior to, or even more likely, after the day of the major eruption. The third shot of the alleged flow progressing down the slope was not filmed on the 3rd of June either, as while we do know that there were helicopters monitoring the volcano on that day, none were able to ascend that far up towards the summit area. 
Also, this flow, while certainly appearing massive enough in the footage, is actually much smaller than what the killer one would end up being, which is actually kind of terrifying to think about. In fact, we know that this footage was actually filmed on the 26th of May, clearly by a media crew who were eager to jump on the excitement of the first flow, which was seen on May 24th. You can see the footage in its entirety online, emerging from the mist just around the summit area before descending the slope and swelling outward. We know that it was on this day that a pyroclastic flow did in fact injure a construction worker, who was in the valley at the time mending a dam that was built to help stop lahars and debris flows. Whether this is that flow or not, I can't entirely be sure, but I doubt it as it appears to start slowing to a stop before it can descend the mountain entirely and reach the valley where that dam was located. And then we have that final iconic shot, which I can confirm was filmed on the 3rd of June. I've seen people out there use a lot of shots from that day and other days that claim to show the killer flow, but they're really just masquerading smaller eruptions in place of the real thing. There were other pyroclastic flows on that day, prior to and after the killer eruption, including a fairly large and well-documented one at 3.57pm, but this famous shot does indeed show the killer eruption when it occurred at 4.08pm. However, even this shot doesn't quite show what you might think it does. For one, the audio that tends to be reproduced, heard here, is actually dubbed, such as the screaming that was actually taken from this clip here. In fact, the real audio sounded like this. I see a lot of misconceptions about what the footage actually shows, with most people assuming that the casualties were somewhere behind these trees in the foreground, while others believe that they were somewhere off to the side to be engulfed when the flow appears to suddenly get halted by an apparently hurricane force wind that completely sweeps it away. But the truth of the matter is actually more complicated than that. And before I address the main issue, no, the person running in front of the fire truck here is not Cartier Craft, like I've seen some speculating it to be, nor is the camera position that of the crafts. This camera position was clearly set up by several media members in an adjacent river valley to where the crafts, Glicken, and most of the media were situated. That's right, the valley shown in the shot isn't actually the valley where the casualties were situated. You see, it took me a while to figure this out myself, as the topography and shape of Mount Unzen has changed quite a bit since 1991, which was fairly early into its five to six years of eruptions. Today, the mountain looks like this. And here is that same position viewed in 1989. This is the area where the casualties took place, in the vicinity of the Mizunashi River Valley, which is where the pyroclastic flows were initially heading down. The famous June 3rd footage, in contrast, was taken from the Akamatsudani Valley, located to the south. Here's a pyroclastic flow viewed on the afternoon of May 24th from the Mizunashi River area. And here's that same pyroclastic flow viewed from the Akamatsudani direction. Deposit maps and photographs show that the June 3rd pyroclastic flow was so large that its outer edges actually spilled into the Akamatsudani Valley. So what we see in the famous footage actually isn't the pyroclastic flow that killed those 43 individuals. Not technically. It was actually an overlap, an outlier of the flow that had overflowed the ridges from the main section and spilled into the neighbouring valley. The larger, killer section of the flow was off to the right of the camera. The area where the crafts, Glicken, and the mass media were situated was actually seen at the very beginning of the footage, hidden in the dispersing ash fall of a previous pyroclastic flow. This was confirmed by volcanologist Yukio Hayakawa on his website, who was apparently one of the ones behind the camera at the time. He also provides an explanation for just why this smaller section was so suddenly sucked away by the wind. As the larger section of the flow travelled down the neighbouring valley and past the camera, it started to suck in the surrounding air as it cooled and began to rise. This can be seen in just how quickly the trees and crops start to move in the foreground. Hence, it pulled the smaller cloud towards the larger main body of the flow.
We can even see this in shots taken from a distance. As the main body of the pyroclastic flow advances from the Mizunashi direction, the Akamatsudani outlier can be seen receding just to the left of the main cloud. So, in conclusion, what we're seeing in this footage is actually not the killer part of the flow, nor is it even the largest part of the flow, which is quite scary considering just how large and terrifying this cloud is already. In reality, no one was within these trees to see it barreling towards them. There were no casualties in the Akamatsudani Valley. All deaths were to the right of the camera in a separate valley beyond the confines of the lens.